Thank you. Um, good morning. Still the morning. I'd like to um, bring you down to earth, in a sense, having uh, listened to Christoph's beautiful global projects. I'd like to present my experience of designing and building tall buildings in London and within the regions of the UK. I want to do this through reference to case studies in Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham and London. Manchester and London are separated by 200 miles, Leeds by the same and Birmingham by almost half that. They are, however, different worlds. A chasm divides London and the regional cities, one that has grown significantly over the last 10 years and continues to expand. This is reinforced by the experience of designing tall buildings within each of these cities, two of which have been completed, one abandoned, and one is currently on site. This contrast and chasm is best demonstrated and explored through certain key themes. In particular, process, design, and value, that is, planning, time, complexity, scale for materiality, and cost, demand, and price. Manchester, Leeds, and Birmingham are cities that embrace change, welcome investment, and seek to attract jobs and people. Manchester, my home city in particular, has a very focused political ambition derived from the need to create a sustainable future for the city. There is access to decision makers offering firm and direct leadership, tangible and named individuals who advise on the merits or otherwise of proposals at the very earliest stage. These may be council members, including the leader, and officers headed by the chief executive, supported by key planning officers who are experienced and familiar with the city. Birmingham and Leeds have a similar and accessible hierarchy of experienced and passionate individuals driving their cities forward, all seeking investment, jobs and people. Developers, clients and design teams welcome clarity at the initial stage of any project, particularly when designing a tall building. Will the proposal gain political support? Does it meet the ambitions and aspirations of the city? A positive response gives confidence and commitment going forward. A negative view can stop the project in its tracks if the concept is flawed. Tall buildings are news. A measure of civic pride, they are aspirational, they help raise a city's confidence and change perceptions of that place. Regardless of the view, whether it's positive or negative, a clear and focused statement avoids frustration, confusion, delay, and abortive costs. A confident council would provide a quick and forceful response. In the early 2000s, various cities were busy developing toll building policies. Both Leeds and Birmingham developed such documents, whilst Manchester was virtually alone in not having a formal document, but deciding to take each project on its own merits. In Leeds, a comprehensive suite of documents was prepared. Civic architect John Thorpe produced valuable guidance alongside numerous sketches contextualising <laughs> tall buildings at a regional level and again in detail within the city core set against the undulating topography of Leeds. He established a framework against which tall buildings could be measured. This sectional drawing of John's was very helpful and informative at the time. Leeds was probably unique in having a civic architect and one who explored proactively the opportunity for integrating tall structures within the fabric of the city. However, very few of those red structures were ever built, including 360 meter high developments of our own. Birmingham produced a document called High Places alongside guidance produced after we'd gained planning permission for Holloway Circus Tower. However, as I've stated, Manchester has never produced a, toll, a written toll building guide. Manchester's toll building policy comprised two simple questions. 
Is it appropriate and is it well designed? And they then assessed any application against the English Heritage and CABE document, Guidance on Tall Buildings, published in March 2003. It's not a policy that seeks to restrict investment or development, create clusters or gather buildings on the city edge. Land ownership and scale prevent such grandiose strategies. A city core such as Manchester's will fit five times inside the London's congestion zone. Each city responds to its own values and sense of place, certain strategies being quite prescriptive, but every tall building policy I've ever read ends with a rider that any proposal would still be considered on its own merits. The unifying theme of such regional cities is scale, the variation being topography and context. The justification process for each city is inevitably detailed and comprehensive, but can be undertaken with the confidence that if the statutory support is forthcoming and an appropriate case can be made with regard to context and design, then the city will invariably embrace the proposal. The key constraint to developing tall buildings within regional cities is not process, it's not actually design, it's value. London values are massively outstripping regional values. They've always been at least three or four times greater than regional values, but recently that has escalated to at least 10 times in prime residential locations, and still three to four times in the outlying suburbs when compared with the prime regional sites. The value of the end product and the cost of achieving it are the two base development criteria. Cost is obviously a fundamental component of the equation, site cost and build cost. While costs are significantly lower in the regions compared with London, there is perhaps a maximum of two or three times build cost on shell and core and base fit out, excluding of course high-end residential apartments in London, which obviously can go between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds a square foot. I speak as an architect, not as a developer, but my comparisons, and my comparisons are really only diagrammatic, but even I can read the headlines. As I've mentioned, we now see values in London up to 10 times regional values, and cost in London only two or three times more. Why would anyone build a tall building outside London? I don't believe we'll see any tall buildings in the regional cities for a few years to come. Due to the constraints of cost and value, a regional tall building will inevitably be residential or mixed use in programme. A small floor plate with multi-occupancy. Holloway Circus Tower in Birmingham is a good example of this. A building with a simple but hopefully elegant form wrapped in a cost-effective envelope system the need to create more with less. Birmingham Holloway Circus was our first true tall building at 39 storeys, although we had built up to 22 storeys in Manchester with number one Deansgate. A building that follows a tight footprint to back of pavement on a gateway site into Birmingham. A mixed use building accommodating a hotel at lower levels with residential above. Planning guidance had identified the site fortunately, as a possible toll building, and the process was quick and seamless. Public spaces, foyers and restaurants were all included within the design. A simple extrusion with an articulated top, a patterned and coloured glazing system, unifying the programme, reinforcing the slenderness and the proportions of the building. The scheme was reduced in height during the process by about 15 storeys, following the anxiety about aeroplanes flying into buildings at the time, as I recall. In Leeds, a project called Lumiere, Lumiere commenced on site, only to be abandoned at the start of, start of the recession, despite having sold many of the apartments and construction in the, of the foundations and the basement. Again, it was a very simple rectangular plan with gently tapering faceted corners, a flexible floor arrangement responding to change and apartment sizing at the upper levels. Two singular forms, a residential tower extending to 52 storeys and a lower commercial tower, a smooth reflective skin, crystalline structures with faceted surfaces, gathered around a new public realm, offering retail and cross-site movement 
under a folding glass arcade. Lumiere would have been an elegant and slender addition to the Leeds skyline. Again, this was actually a very well-supported and seamless process from concept to site. The Manchester Hilton in Manchester, again, is a mixed-use tower, similar in, similar in brief to the Birmingham project and for the same client, the Beetham organisation. An efficient rectilinear floor plan. The lower two floors comprising hotel rooms across a corridor, a new public bar and restaurant at level 23 and residential levels at levels 25 to 48. A smooth, unitized glazing system unifies the program into a singular form, stepping out towards the city centre, counterbalanced by the four-storey glass blade to the south, which is in effect a continuation of the outer double skin to the Winter Garden. A very slender profile to the east and west, a four-metre cantilever articulates that change in program. A distinctive expression of the apartments is achieved by the individually controlled louvers to the south elevation, constantly animating that facade. The base of the podium building, ballroom and meeting spaces sits in the foreground. A view from Castlefield, a juxtaposition of old and new. The public spaces and entrance lobby, bar and spa were all part of the design. The glass surface of the, of the building picks up the constantly changing light, transforming it every day at all times of the day, particularly at sunset and during dramatic storms. It's a very elegant and slender and very low cost building helping to define Manchester's skylines. In the regions, the key constraint, as I've said, is value, not process. London is the complete opposite. From an architectural point of view, the key constraint is process, and some may say for very good reasons. A large array of vested interests are brought to bear, commencing with the specific requirements of the borough in which the building is sited, often contra contradicting London-centric concerns. The GLA, English Heritage, opposing boroughs, local pressure groups, public bodies, etc., etc. The supporting documentation for a planning application is extensive. If we take one Blackfriars, for example, the process was protracted, complicated, and expensive to produce, including addressing the London View Management Framework, the London Plan, the KBH Guidance and Toll Buildings, amongst others, including a public inquiry. There is no overriding clarity, no coordinating focus, individual stakeholders, all express their own specific concerns and requirements, often contradicting and opposing the planning officers and the borough's own political ambitions. It would be good if London could, at some stage, speak with one voice. Timescales involved in designing and developing buildings within the regions and London are equally revealing. From producing a concept sketch for the Manchester Hilton, to starting on site was 11 months, including the full planning process, detailed design, and the tender process. From starting work on Blackfriars to starting effectively on site will have taken 10 years. One Blackfriars, however, is at last moving forward, and we've recently started on site with St George, part of the Barclay Group, and we're very excited about seeing the building realised. The site is located at the bridgehead of Blackfriars Road on the south side. The concept was for a form rising and turning towards a city. We wanted to achieve a very site-specific building. A tall building at this point reinforces the undulating waveform along the south bank. It's a dynamic site with the movement of the river and the Blackfriars Road. The form suggests movement and a sense of direction. It's the gateway to Southwark the termination of the bridge. The form evolved from 2004 through to 2007, reducing in height, but returning, retaining the asymmetrical and dynamic shape, generating 50 organic floor plans, each different from one another, providing 274 apartments. It's a smooth, sculptural, 
organic form. A continuous changing surface is glazed, reflective and changing. It's a measured, refined form, at one that's taught a fluid outer surface of low iron glass. This little diagram just compares and contrasts it with other landmark London buildings. It's a twin skin structure which accommodates the amenity space required of residential accommodation in London. The inner skin provides the thermal barrier. It's rectilinear, partially glazed, with subtle colouring. The outer skin, curving and dynamic, fully glazed, responds to form. The outer glazing comprises wrapped, warped, single and double curved panels of glass, 18,000 square metres of bespoke glazing. Each single panel is unique and particular to its location, creating elevations with depth and texture. A singular beautiful form that I feel reveals its program on closer inspection, changing and evolving through use. It's a residential tower, it's not a commercial tower. With regard to the process, it's not unexpected to encounter such a response to a new development, particularly tall building, and particularly within a global city like London. But it's extremely disheartening, time-consuming and expensive and risky to comp contemplate designing and developing such a tall building in the capital. There is inherent suspicion, a default mode to know. It is not, in my view, a sustainable strategy. It is essential that London grows and evolves if the UK is to compete on a global basis. We should not allow the fabric of the city to become static and two-dimensional. Values are high and demand for London real estate is insatiable at the moment. It's a perfect platform for change and evolution. Build costs are higher in London than in the region, but such a difference is required to reflect the cost of creating beautiful, elegant forms and architecturally significant buildings. Buildings that complement the context and enhance the heritage of the city, underpin the process and establish value. There is always demand for a bespoke and unique creation. Contrasting London and the regions is a bit like comparing Couture with Pret-a-Porter, both aspirational but appealing to a different market and context, a global demand against a regional one. Each, each tall building, be it in London, Manchester, Birmingham or Leeds, is hopefully unique to place and is a direct product of process, programme, context and demand. As architects, we can only hope to sustain a vision of elegance and beauty and ensure that any tall building contributes positively to the city skyline, supports the city's political ambition and inspires its citizens. Thank you. Thank you.